Welcome to the show. Today, simplifying transformation through measurement and visualization with Michael McCalla and the great team from the Enterprise Agility World Community. Join us at community.eau.university. On, on a journey of uh, agile transformation through visualization and measurement, so which is going to be a great um, talk uh, for all of us, especially um, I, um, we shared just a few minutes ago from Loretto um, uh, why she was here and I can resonate with her as well. A lot of agile coaches are being asked to um, solve the problems uh, for the organization. So it's really good to have a um, lot of like-minded individuals uh, with us today. I will start the recording of the um, so the meeting has been recorded uh, is been recording and we will make it available on our community website so please do join us and register on the community website so you can watch the uh, event at any point in time so let's kick it off um, and Mike's going to be with us today um, so just wanted to share a little bit about ourselves, uh, who we are um, at Enterprise Agility World Community. And for us, we look at, um, we are very passionate uh, bunch of people and we are all around the world. So we are a diverse group. So our values that we uh, live by on a daily basis is we learn to, we teach to empower and learn. So that's how we go about it. We we breathe and practice humility, and we do have some big hitters uh, in in our group, and um, it's it's fun to learn from them. And we always look at data when we are improving. So we look at innovation, and we look at diversity. And we are always looking at being a diverse group. So if you come, you'll see when you join us in the group that there'll be people from all around the world. And one good part of that is I get to test my um, sleeping patterns some days. Uh, being here in Australia is uh, Eric's taken me on a journey of being on calls at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 5 a.m. At some point, I'm going to return the favor to him as well. Um, so but that's, that's, that's been a really good, inspiring one uh, for us. Mike, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so for us, um, I would love uh, for all of you to look at um, this event as an event for yourself. It's not an, uh, a one-way conversation. It's something that we want all of us to communicate and have a conversation. Imagine we are all in a big round table conference room sitting there and not just getting um, a broadcast. So. If everyone's happy, um, however you feel comfortable, give me an emoji, give me a thumbs up, give me a um, high five. Um, is, is everyone okay to be curious today um, so that we can um, come come in with an open mind, open heart? Um, let's um, show Mike our enthusiasm. I know metrics, sometimes it feels uh, very dull and boring, but let's let's be enthusiastic about what we want to learn today. Um, and let's support. Um, is everyone okay to support each other? If you feel someone has a burning question, is and and are not able to express it, uh, please help them out. Um, and technology sometimes is uh, best um, is best when it works, and it's worst when it falls over. So if you're having that problem, please do reach out to us. We'll do our best to help you out. Um, Let's be inclusive. So for us, we have to include all points of view. Um, it's OK to be controversial. It's OK not to agree with what we are going to present to you. Um, so be inclusive in your thoughts in how you want to communicate. And most most importantly, we want us all of us to be memorable. This is something that it's a journey that you will go on with, which is going to be very interesting. So who would love to be? this to be a memorable experience and uh, either a great start of the day or a uh, event when you, uh, you've you got that great uh, memory to go off to and dream about it. And 
uh, most of most uh, important we in the community are very grateful so this is for us as a community that you have honored us to be here uh, together and supporting uh, us uh, in presenting the topic um, and with with that i want to introduce to you uh, mike mckala he is a technology leader a coach a business agility specialist who has been assisting organizations to create value driven environment that have fostered collaboration empowerment safety and learning his experience has included leading multiple agile transformations for both information technology and business divisions and has stood up various innovative units and is the founder creator of the lean agile intelligence uh, one of the um, which is one of the top uh, bus business agility assessment platform and i can tell you from first hand experience i've been using and experimenting with it and lastly michael's got hand his hands on experience pragmatic and adaptive style is has enabled clients to reach their desired business outcome so i'm hoping you'll get as much as value as i have done exploring what by interact with my interacting with michael so with further ado please give a warm welcome to our first speaker today our our the speaker michael mckella who is going to take us through the journey of agile transformation so welcome michael thanks the Nathan. stage is all it. yours <laughs> thank you thank you everyone for joining today i appreciate the opportunity to um to teach and talk about some of my experiences and our client experiences. Um, first and foremost, let's level set on what we're gonna learn today. So we're gonna learn from each other, not just me, what are some of our transformation pain points? Uh, talk about what we're struggling with and maybe come up with some solutions on how we can help one another. So we're gonna do that uh, early in this uh, session. We're then gonna to get together and talk through some effective techniques that I've used in the past to measure transformation um, and drive the conversation and orchestrate positive change. We're gonna talk measuring team performance and talk a little bit about how together with team performance, that will build a comprehensive measurement strategy that you can use um, when talking to leadership about the changes that are needed. And then finally, um, some tactical bullet. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how to go about collecting the metrics on a cadence um, and then how to report out essentially how to visualize the change and tell the story, identify cause and effect, um, and start to talk about next steps for improvement. So, Mike, I think you've sparked a uh, lot of curiosity if it's okay i might just invite a few individuals to um give their thoughts and then we'll continue let's do it that sounds okay. good okay sade you had a question uh feel free to um go for your question hi um I don't, I don't really have a question right now. I'm just really curious to see what we're going to pick up today. So I'm really, really excited. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ahmed, um, was that a question or was that a virtual high five you were giving me as well? It's just a high, uh, a high five. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. All right. Yeah. Not a problem. Um, all yours, uh, Mike. Um, and. Um, yeah. As as we go, we'll monitor and we'll let you know um, as people are asking questions. We're getting okay. some virtual high fives as well, um, so that's great. Virtual high fives are good. Yeah, they um, are. So I've lived the life of a change agent for about 15 years uh, before I started the Lean Agile Intelligence platform. And I can tell you, um, a majority of my days, I looked like this. OK, just frustrated um, and and feeling like nobody was listening. So I want to ask you, OK, as a change agent, do you feel like you're making progress? 
do you feel like you're getting cooperation from all stakeholders? Do you feel people are really listening to you? And do you feel like you're failing on some days, that you're not moving the needle and not performing up to par for what you were brought in to do as a transformation agent? If you're feeling one of these, please raise your hand um, and let us know. Because the important thing is you're not alone. Looks like we're getting some hand raises here. Plus five, plus yeah. six. Yeah. It's it actually resonates uh, quite a bit um, for us um, uh, as well. It's you take two steps forward. Sometimes it feels you've taken ten steps back, and then you've got to talk about what did you do the whole day. So it it does feel uh, a game of inches sometimes. For sure. Um, and the important thing really to understand is you're not alone, okay? Um, and there's many sources out there. I, I grabbed this one from Forbes because it was a combination of a couple different sources um, that basically says there's a risk of failure for 70% to 95% of transformations. Now, we can get into what failure means. Um, in my world, it's simply not delivering um, the anticipated benefits uh, for a transformation. And so let's use that as kind of our guiding light. When we talk about transformation failure, it's more about what outcomes were set out to, set out to be achieved and we didn't actually achieve them, right? Everyone says from a transformation, we're looking to get to market quicker with our products. We're looking to um, improve our customer satisfaction so they would uh, refer us to their friends and family. We want to build quality in and have very stable solutions um, and not have any downtime. When we talk about failure, we talk about more or less what did you set out to do from an outcome perspective? And we're going to get into this. Um, and what was that target you were aiming for? And why aren't you there today? OK, um, so to simplify that failure world, I want to make sure that we level set on the fact that this is basically we did not achieve the anticipated benefits, the benefits that we forecast it and the benefits that we were told we would get. Now, in working with many clients over the years, we get a lot of feedback. And as we go through and mind that theme feedback, we've really abstracted three different themes okay, that we've seen as a result of the first one is there's just a lack of understanding of the magnitude of this change. So we've all embarked on these quote unquote agile transformations. Um, but I think we all know now that standing up a team, a cross-functional team that is somewhat self-organizing, working on a project is not a transformation, okay? Um, if we truly want to survive the digital economy, the accelerated markets of today, we need to be agile as an organization. And so what we've really seen is st uh, stakeholders around these teams do not necessarily understand what is needed. Okay. What are the, how does the ecosystem need to change around them? Because everybody is impacted in order to go fast, right? Traditional ways of working, okay, are not solving the problem. So we need to move to new collaborative value-driven ways of working. And there's just a lack of understanding of what that really takes, okay? We can all sit here and say, okay, we've stood up these teams, they're delivering, but our funding model is no longer congruent to that way of working. Our team performance model does not align with this way of working. And so we're constantly kind of working around these things instead of, because the stakeholders that are in those areas have not been engaged and involved since the beginning. 
And it's because there's a lack of understanding. The next thing that we've seen, the theme that, uh, that uh, has come up a number of times is really, what does success look like? Where are we at in our journey? And what are the next steps? Because based off of those next steps, who's going to need to actually get engaged and who's going to need to contribute? Okay. Once you stand up a few teams, are you considered done? I hope not. Um, but it's good to understand where you're at in the journey and what is next. And then make a decision as a leadership team on whether or not you want to continue forward and constantly change. I hope so, because I think we all know on this call that change is it's an evolution, right? It should be ongoing and continuous. The word transformation, transformation tends to be misleading because it does imply that there's an end. And I think we all know that's not the case. But knowing where we're at on the journey and what could be next, okay? For example, if we stood up a couple agile teams and we're seeing some faster than market, more engagement from our customers, um, are we happy with just that? Or is the next step for you maybe aligning to value streams? So really understanding, okay, here's the first step of the journey. Here's where we're at today. What's next? Who needs to be involved? Is the benefits going to be worth the cost? And those costs are typically distractions and disruptions, right? Um, and really having an understanding of where you're at on the journey. That's the last wonderful. Thing. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mom. Um, I I was going to talk. So one, once you um, finish the next statement, I'll probably give some more um, insights on what we're going to do next as well. Go for it. Cool. Um, the, fi the final one here is really alignment on the outcomes. I think if there's one thing that we've learned over the past 22 years since the signing of the manifesto was that it's not one size fits all. And Agile is not the goal. Agile is no more, no less an enabler of us achieving our outcomes that will ultimately deliver our business objectives to our customers and our stakeholders. So when we embark on this journey, giving that multiple stakeholders across different verticals need to be aligned, often they don't understand the why. Okay? There's not that sense of urgency that we need to drive change as change agents. There's not that alignment that we need as change agents. Um, in a LinkedIn post that went Pretty, was pretty popular last week of mine. And I talked a little bit about this sense of urgency and how the pandemic was the one time, not the one time, I shouldn't say that, but was a time where I saw a lot of organizations rally around a common purpose, okay? It created a sense of urgency. They started to work across verticals. They started to go much faster because the pandemic created the sense of urgency. So. When you have that and you have a, a, a mission and a purpose and the why behind the change, it makes the change much easier. That's Go ahead, Martha. Wonderful. On, on that note, what we would love for us to do is we're going to break out in small groups in the next um, five for the five to seven minutes. And if we can go into that breakout room, um, find out um, a timekeeper. So it'd be great for one of you to um, be uh, accountable and self-organized as we love to do that. Introduce yourself, talk about what is there and um, pick one of those um, themes that Mike has just talked about saying the lack of understanding uh, of the chain, magnitude of the change or the clarity that has caused grief for you or even the alignment to the outcome transformations that uh, you you've seen how does that sound for everyone does is that something we are okay to start doing um so i would then um that's wonderful that's great news so i will um so what i was learning uh is that um that you know people feel safe in their ways of working and i and that really stood out for me is that how do you take someone out of their comfort zone um, during, uh, say, an agile transformation? Um, and so 
it sounds simple, but that's really, I think, what it, a lot of this boils down to is people feel safe in, in the current way of doing things. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Michelle. Um, anyone else would like to um, share before Mike takes us through the journey? We'll have one more share yeah. and then we'll go in the journey. I'll share. Hi, I'm not I'm not on camera, but hopefully you can all hear me. Um, uh, my name is Akosia and I'm based here in the UK. So I'm a business transformation consultant. Um, I think from the, the three points that were mentioned before, the key one that I've got the most experience with is probably not understanding um, the magnitude or the impact of the change. And a lot of the time that's because the initial work to kind of assess the stakeholder landscape and, you know, undertake a thorough impact assessment across the stakeholder groups that are impacted is not done thoroughly enough. So at the point of delivery, you almost, you know, you meet a lot of resistance because you haven't understood the real impacts. And essentially, if your your plans and your strategy, your change strategy hasn't incorporated those those impacts then you, you you basically hit a lot of a lot of resistance that can impact on the success of the delivery as well so yeah that's my two cents wonderful thanks for sharing um we do have one question sylvie um go for it thank you um it's funny because i somebody from canada is in the same topic and michael you may know him um, the other element, too, is we need to be cautious about the folks who have jobs where they are measured by being thorough, regulated, have a professional order that they can't really step out of their boundaries, or they're in the field that is highly regulated. Finance comes to mind in Canada, transportation, um, and so on. It's extremely difficult for them because that's, first of all, they've never been measured this way. And secondly, there has to be an awareness by the executives that they need to change that measurement and that mindset for which they were so, let's call them, you know, revered before. And sometimes, and it's happened here in, in Quebec, you have to go to the regulator and say, are you going to allow me to have that flexibility so that, and I'm, I'm speaking of the fintech space here, so that I can move forward with this solution and this project, because if not, then... As I move forward, I'm going to get my hand slapped by the regulators. Wonderful. That's great. Um, probably, Mike, if you want to continue with the journey, Anna, I know you've got a question. If we can put it in the chat, we'll probably, if you're okay, um, to put that in the chat. And I am, I my sixth sense is saying Mike's already knowing what your question is and he will have an answer. So let's test <laughs> his capable, his sixth sense today. So, Mike, oh. all yours. Um, thank you, everyone, for your feedback um, as a result of the breakout rooms. It's it's very helpful. Um, the one thing that came up in ours was actually there's a lack of aligning to a common purpose, right? And and being able to um, align to what we're trying to achieve. And so that was something that has resonated with me and, and I've been exposed to. But moving on, um, this shouldn't be a surprise to us. As Angelus, we know that the organization in and of itself is a complex adaptive system. Sorry, so which, <clears throat> as Angelus, there's, this should be to no surprise that transformation is complex. And because in and of itself, the organization is a complex adaptive system, which is a series of components that must dynamically interact with one another to deliver a result. Um, the other challenge that we have as transformation leaders is that you can't see or feel the transformation. It's not necessarily tangible. So how do we know that we're moving in the right direction? How do we know um, that we can positively orchestrate change? So we're up against it, right? The, the being a transformation leader is, is you know, and I'm sure you can all attest, is, is one of the hardest jobs on the planet because you are up against a very complex system. Um, that in and of itself is made up of people that are working together. There was a lot of talk about um, people um, not wanting to change. So here we have a complex system of moving, lots of moving parts that are made up of people who, who of them very of themselves is a 
um, complex adaptive system. So needless to say, the task is daunting. So how do we succeed? I was in your I was in the same spot that you were many, many moons ago. And coming up through the data ranks uh, and through the product space, I had a natural inclination to lean on data because ultimately I realized that given the complex nature of the transformation, the first thing I had to do was simplify it. And the easiest way to simplify things, um, as a lot of the Kanban folks know out there, is to visualize. And the way you visualize things is you need to have a collection of data that allows you to do that. So what this today's session is about and what we're going to get into is, A, transformation is complex and we need to simplify it. How do we do that? We do that through measurement and visualization. Now, I know what you're probably saying. Well, we have a lot of metrics around, right? We do use metrics, but we still have no change. Totally get it. I've been there, right? I'm sure many of you are using JIRA and, and your JIRA dashboards, but still you feel like you're up against it and there's been no progress. And what I've seen over the years is the problems with most organization data is sometimes there's too much. How do we make uh, the most out of it, right? Where is it located? How does it overlay? There's different sources of information. It's just scrambled everywhere. And how is it? And it's not telling us a cohesive story. It's complicated. I remember the first time I showed a uh, cumulative flow diagram to an executive, and I, I think his head almost exploded, right? Um, and so we tend to complicate things when really, again, leaders are only really interested in the progress that we're making. Finally, a lot of times we're not measuring the right things. Okay, we've all been down the road of the velocity wars, right? Um, velocity is a pred predictability metric, not a productivity metric. And we get so anchored onto that. Is that real? We, are, we can have the best velocity in the world. We can go as fast as possible. But if you are not delivering the right things to your customer, it does not matter. Mike, so we have to, I might take yeah. a pause there if it's okay. Um, Anna, if you had your question, please feel free to put it in the chat, or um, then we can we can we can we can post it to Mike as well. So go for it, Mike. Okay. Um, so after years of experimentation, okay, and let me preface that by saying. Um, I've learned a lot about how to use metrics the right way, how to drive change um, in you and, and using metrics and data and the visualization that it creates to tell a story and to drive that alignment that many of us said we're missing. So there's three, three things that we're going to drill down into today that I feel can help move the needle. The first one is a balanced metric framework that have outcome categories. So looking at different categories of metrics, all that align to a specific outcome. The second one is using a sliding scale with ranges for metrics. So instead of displaying a number, simply we just display where they're at on a scale of one to five. And then finally, taking a look at all of the transformation components. So not just velocity, but more or less the practices, are they be adopted correctly? The behaviors often overlook the cultural aspect of this. They need to be looked at and measured along with the performance of the teams in a balanced way and using key results, which many folks now call OKRs, um, I would call them the lagging indicators. What is this transformation resulting in from a business perspective? The first one that we're going to look at is the outcome categories and the bounce metric framework. Now, the truth is, and I think this will all resonate, is leadership cares about outcomes. What they don't care about is how they are achieved. Okay. Um, 
Sure, there could be some knowledge of what's going on and how we're making the sausage, so to speak. But at the end of the day, what they worry about is, are we delivering to our stakeholders and, and customers? What are the outcomes that we are achieving as an organization? So this is what we need to lead with. This is what transformation leaders need to enter the conversation with. Please do not enter it with, we need to do agile because that will not resonate. And we know after years and years of experimentation that we really need to lead with outcomes. What are you after? Because at the end of the day, yes, it'll probably be an agile way of working. There'll be a little sprinkle of lean. It'll probably be some systems thinking. We'll probably do personas and customer journey maps and design thinking. But together, it's really about what are we ultimately out to achieve? So when we're leading, we need to start with outcomes and drive that alignment across the groups. Again, the how, okay? It's not what you want to lead with because that's where the resistance will come in. It's much more natural to, to lead with what you want to achieve than with chain, inflicting change on people and how they work. If we can first align to an outcome, then everything else, and there will be resistance still, but it'll be much more natural and we can actually have a story and a why behind it to really start to move the needle. Now, when we talk about outcomes, and this is a term that is, is used in a multiple uh, different ways, the way we define it here at Lean Agile Intelligence is it's what we wish to achieve as a result of an action. Okay. And that's about as concrete and clear as I can make it. So when you apply that concept to transformation, it's what we wish to achieve as a result of undergoing this transformation. And many of the outcomes that we see, especially in the IT data right, is um, depicted there in that graph where we're talking about customer satisfaction, okay? Um, the digital world has made switching costs very easy, and are we delivering value to our customers? Reliability, do we, are, are our solutions sound, right? Or do they stay up? Time to market, are we able to get to market faster than our competitors with a new product? Responsiveness, are we able to respond to change, such as, um, a global pandemic. Growth and revenue. Are we protecting ourselves, making sure we're growing in other areas? That's coupled with innovation, right? Are we protecting from disruption? Predictability. Are we able to tell our stakeholders and customers when we're going to deliver so they can plan accordingly? And then finally, and perhaps most important, okay, are our people engaged? Do they feel like they're contributing to a, a purpose and a mission, right? Are they sticking around? Are we growing talent internally? That's really important. So these are the outcomes that any executive would say they're looking to achieve from a transformation. That's probably, we do have a few people who've got questions. Um, if, um, Anna, um, if you want to uh, ask a question first and then I'll go to the next individual. Uh, Eric, give me a minute. And I, if you're okay to come off mute um, or put in your question. Yeah, so my question was, um, how do we have awareness? Awareness of? Of the problem initially. I think for me, that's been the challenge <laughs> that I didn't know there was a problem until gotcha until I knew there was a problem and then it was too late. Yeah, so I think it starts with baselining your metrics or understanding where you're at and understanding that, hey, here is where their bottlenecks are within the system of work and highlighting those problems. So to create awareness, maybe you start visualizing work from a Kanban perspective. Um, and that's what Kanban says, start from where you're at and then start to visualize the work and identify the bottlenecks um, theory of constraints, right? So that to me was something that I think you could do by just, if you wanna paint the picture that there is a problem, 
the other piece there is surveys and assessments. Like here's where, here's where the industry is at. Here's what really good looks like. Where are we at on the continuum? A lot of organizations will take business agility assessments now, team assessments. And when they see just how far they are behind, it can create some awareness. Cool. Um, we'll go to uh, Eric next. Um, can I request if probably you are in an environment that you've got background noise, if you could please mute yourself if you're not uh, asking a question, if you've not already done so, that'd be great. Uh, Eric, go for it. Yes. OK, cool. So I have a question regarding um, many of the people here probably have been following um, or embracing um, the classic Agile manifesto 2001 and the metrics that are heavily oriented in software in the software industry. How you think that a company can start moving? Because part of enterprise agility is is started understanding that sometimes the, the um, the vision you have when you start with Agile is a little bit restricted and IT oriented. Now, the more you move outside this world, the more you realize that you need to expand the different um, um, indicators, right? And in here, I have uh, two small questions which are related. The first one is how you know which indicators to have on board. And second is, and this is um, related to a previous question, I think it was Anna, how you become aware that, uh, or if people outside you become aware that they need it? Mike, you're on mute. Mike, if you're hearing what? us, you can, can you okay. hear me now? Yes, we can. Let me just make sure this is on. Sure. Good. You can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yeah. So the first one, Eric, is I would say do not start with Agile, right? And um, Let's no matter whether you are starting at the business side or you're starting a value stream across your organization, start with the outcome that you're setting out to achieve um, and let everything else fall into place. Now, that's probably going to include some agile ways of working, some lean ways of working. But if you lean with with outcomes, the that agile delivery um, terminology and application hopefully is not there and if it is right within the organization that's an IT and agile was the goal we need to shift focus and shift focus to what is it we're after what is it we're after within this initiative what is it we're after at from a strategy standpoint and let's measure it and so that would be the first one the awareness piece um i felt like um when i answered in regards to visualizing work just the flow of work across different silos where are the bottlenecks um, as well as just taking a step back and evaluating yourself doing an assessment seeing where you're at um, and where your areas for opportunity are based off of what you're trying to achieve in your context not just you know you know go agile to go agile and all right so Continue, I'm going to continue Mike. on. We we're a little tight on time. Um, part. So uh, a balanced metric framework. So what we're talking about here is taking um, a few of the outcomes that we saw in the previous slide, right, that most organizations are after to gain a competitive advantage in the digital economy, right, and take a look when you start to measure, not to just focus on one. And the reality is when you say to someone, what are you after? They will tell you, oh, time to market, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction. Well, the reality is, right, that you have to make trade-offs because these will pull on one another. So you really have to look to say to yourself, what's really important? And this could be maybe within a vertical of an organization where like their outcomes could be different than your outcomes. Now it should all ladder up to the organization and you can achieve that through OKRs. But 
at the end of the day, when you're focusing on change, we need to focus on different categories of that change that are important to us. Reason being, it will drive the conversations, um, mitigate bias, eliminate misinterpretations. Okay. Most importantly, it's going to lead to trade-off decisions. Okay. Well, we really want to get the market with this new product, but we're going to have to skip testing, right? Um, well, that's going to pull on reliability. Um, well, we really need to make sure we're delivering the right thing. So we need to get contact with our customers, but that's going to take long. So these things are all going to start to pull on one another. And ultimately, this is going to give you insights to what is it we need to do next to move the needle? So whenever you're measuring, you should really take a look at different categories of metrics, and they really should be outcome-centric. Out, outcome so for example, if I'm looking at customer satisfaction, um, and I would say within your bounced framework, you really should only be measuring anywhere from two to four metrics, right? And quite frankly, what I've seen really effective is the, the less number of metrics in each one of these categories, the better, because now you're only focused on one. Now, you do need balancing metrics. Um, that's a concept in the industry. But the point of this is keep it simple, right? So the first thing is, what is it that we're after and how are we going to measure that? So customer satisfaction, retention rate, right? Are our customers renewing every year? Conversion rate, are we getting new customers? Net promoter score. Are they going to refer us to um, their friends and family? Time to market. How fast are we delivering um, new products to the market? How many new features a quarter are we delivering? How often are we deploying? Reliability. So how many outages do we have? How many escape defects have gotten to production and have shut it down? Right. From a, from a leading standpoint, what does our test coverage look like? And when we deploy a change, what is, the, what is the percentage of time that it leads to a failure? So notice that none of these say velocity or right, we're tying these to an outcome that you've had conversations with your stakeholder on. This is what we're after. Okay. And yes, there's going to be multiple outcomes because there always is and they'll be balanced off of one another. But the important thing is it'll allow you to make trade-off decisions because you won't just be focused on one specific area. So um, that's um, just wanted to probably um, also open up a little bit. If um, does this spark any curiosity um, to anyone? Is it making sense to everyone? Um, give me a thumbs up, a high five, whatever um, is convenient. Um, Carlos does have a question. Michael is what? Why time to market is an is an outcome? It's an outcome of your transformation, right? So when we're talking about transformation, if you go back to the what, it's what do we want to achieve as a result of transforming the way we work, and that outcome as typically, well, we need to get the market faster. So this is an outcome of the transformation. That's how, that's how we look at it. Now, you could have an outcome of a deliverable, right? Um, but more or less, the different categories of outcomes, what we're looking at is how do we measure a transformation? Well, you start with what do you want to achieve with that transformation? Yes, we all know we want to achieve business objectives, but in order to achieve those business objectives, what do you need your operating model to, to uh, where do you need your operating model to improve? Because that should be the focus. Hence, that's why time the market is an outcome. Okay. Um, Mike, are we okay for two questions or should we, um, so we'll yeah, we'll take yeah, one I mean, more question? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, Eric um, has asked, what do you find more difficult when measuring? Well, the hardest thing to measure is, uh, I think, customer satisfaction um, because and employee satisfaction. So how are people feeling? Um, because it's not, not writing our, our JIRAs, right? You can get cycle time throughput and deployment frequency through JIRA, same thing with reliability. But how do we know we're actually pleasing our customers and delivering the right thing? 
Um, sure, we can look at retention rate. Um, we can see if we're getting new customers. We can we can say, hey, would you would you rate us uh, from a one to a ten, and would you re refer us to uh, to your friends and family? That'll give us net promoter score. But are we really solving their needs? And it's really more about the conversation um, that these type of metrics drive and the engagement with your customers. But by far, the hardest thing is customer satisfaction in my mind. Greg, I noticed you put your hand up and you put it down. I'm not sure, did Michael answer your question? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, Michael, I didn't see employee satisfaction here, but I think that's one of the more crucial things today. Um, but you did mention it before. So, um, yeah. yeah, Greg, if you can see here, I'm just slicing, I'm taking um, three of the eight outcomes that we came up with here um, and basically just depicting that for this specific area, this is what they're focused on at this point in time. But you, you make a valid point in that employee satisfaction is a fundamental core concept and outcome that we should be focused on as part of the transformation. Wonderful. Um, um, those were the questions so far. I'll keep monitoring it. Uh, go for it. Um, sure. All right. So, so um, now that we've kind of associated and and landed with um, leading with outcomes and having a balanced um, approach with different outcomes, the next piece of simplifying is really just to start using ranges and ratings. And the benefits of doing that is it creates a common understanding of what good looks like. Um, when you're looking at any type of metrics, whether they be cons uh, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, they all are different. And so you have to explain the number and what it means. And it's always a battle to understand because there could be so many. So not everyone understands. It's also a simple format um, that so when you use ratings, it just simplifies things and it is it helps you identify cause and effect across metrics because you can see as a result of the movement of one, we've we've uh, moved in the other. And so from a ratings and ranges standpoint, the way you go about setting these up is put all your metrics on a sliding scale. Um, and that sliding scale could be anything. It could be one to 10, it could be one to five. I think the smaller, the better, right? And basically what you're creating is, everyone knows that if you're at the high point of the scale, that's good, right? That's good. And maybe you won't even need to talk about that. Um, everyone knows if you're at the, more at the bottom, right? We need to focus our efforts and our improvement efforts there. So a sliding scale simplifies things, especially when you're talking to folks that don't necessarily always understand the metrics that we are um, measuring. You then want to associate each rating on the scale with a range of values. So this actually will allow you to, again, that next level of simplification is basically to say, if someone falls within this range, Let's just be able to say that they are this on the scale, a two, a three. Um, you can use you can use names, emerging, adapting, like we use in Lean Agile Intelligence if we don't want to use necessarily a, a numbers. Uh, however, it's the ranges, right? And you're gonna you're gonna want to set these ranges based off of your context. What does high performing look like? What does low performing look like? Associate the colors, uh, associate colors with ratings. Um, all visualization um, will come from color patterns, and this will be help identify um, where we're at in in um, on the scale. And then finally, make the last rating very aspirational, right? Something that we really want to reach for. Um, is it achievable? We don't know, but we're really going to try hard. So that's just simplifying and putting everything on a scale. So for each metric in your framework, um, if you put it on a sliding scale from zero to, or one to five, no matter what it is, you're creating this common understanding of what good looks like, okay? It's hard often to talk about these numbers and show dashboards. 
The second thing that I just want to remind folks is whenever it comes to any type of metrics, um, the focus should be the trends, not necessarily the absolute number. Are we trending up? Are we trending down? And asking the question why. We use metrics to gather insights and attempt improvement experiments, right? Um, and to be able to provide some type of guidance on, are we moving in the right direction? Now, we all love our pretty looking dashboards. I do, I can tell you that, I'm a, I'm a bit of a data nerd. Um, but the reality is, remember, transformation is very complex. People don't understand the magnitude. If you're going to talk about a transformation dashboard, then this is just something like this would just simply be more confusing if you ask me um, and from experience. Instead, to simplify it, you simply would um, look at the outcomes you want to achieve, look at how you're measuring those outcomes and where you're at on the sliding scale from a color perspective, right? And where are you trending? So something a lot more easier to digest Again, we're leading with the outcomes we're trying to achieve from the transformation. We've associated those outcomes with measurements that are indicators of our success. We're then looking at them and saying, where are we at on the continuum? All right? Are we at the bottom of the scale? Are we at the top? Even more importantly, how are we trending? Which one of these are pulling on one another? Right? Is time to market impacting customer satisfaction? is reliability impacting time to market? Because we see that a lot, right? Because we have to bake in quality. So this is just a, an easy, yep. simple dashboard that you can use instead of something complex, again, to simplify the transformation. Mike, just a quick one. We've got 10 minutes with the group. Um, should we spend the next 10 minutes for um, Q&A? And probably if you're open to it, um, to have a follow-up deep dive session with the community? Yeah, I think what I want to do, uh, Mafan, is get through the third piece here. Um, okay. That that will take probably about five to, to six minutes, and then um, I can stay behind for any Q&A, and then we can always do a deep dive for the community. Okay, wonderful. Um, so if we can, yeah, let's do it for the next five minutes, and then... Um, also in the chat, there is a post event uh, survey. So if you can um, fill that out um, when you when you get a chance, that'd be great. Uh, sure. There Please. you go, Mike. All right. So just to, when we're looking at transformation, a lot of the things that we've talked about so far has been performance and key results, such as retention, um, throughput, cycle time. But one of the things that we need to look at, um, especially as change agents, is um, the practices that we're adopting and how well are we doing them and the behaviors um, within the system of work um, and how are we interacting with people. So, for example, and we've talked about performance and key results on the right, so I won't dive into that. But practices, what we're talking about with practices are the practices that are um, adopted to be able to respond to change. Right. So things like iterative planning, backlog refinement. Um, prioritization, discovery, do we understand who our clients are? Behaviors are those things that we look at from a cultural perspective, right? Are we collaborating together, holding ourselves accountable? Um, those are leadership enabling. Do we feel safe to run an experiment and fail? This is the other side of transformation. So really looking at what are the practices we are adopting? How are we behaving? And is it in line with what we want to achieve? Now, when you start to look at the, tra the transformation components, most measure performance. I can't say mo many people will do cycle time and throughput. There's probably a velocity there, right? Um, but a lot, most organizations will have some type of team performance metrics. Many organizations are getting better at adopting OKRs, okay? And, and OKRs is a popular um, way to drive alignment by having an objective and then be able to measure it through key results. The reality is few measure, you know, your practices and behaviors. And the reason is, well, it's hard. How do you measure 
practices and behaviors, right? They don't know how, right? And quite frankly, a lot don't think it's very important. And for us, it is because that's where we could have the most impact, okay, on what practices are adopted to drive the right conversations for adopting new ways of working, for driving conversations on how we should behave in order to meet the outcomes that we're after. So in order to, to directly impact that and show the progress, visualize the progress, you need to be able to measure practices and behaviors along with performance and key results. Why? It's going to inform coaching plans, right? We have lots of agile consultants out there. Um, what's their plan look like to help us move the needle? We need to be able to show improvement early in the transformation. Okay, people will start to ask, are we moving in the right direction? And the reality is revenue and growth and retention rate aren't going to move immediately. They're more lagging indicators. It also helps us identify some cause and effect and some patterns throughout the organization that we can say, here are frictions within the system that are preventing us from working in this way. Um, this is just a, uh, an example of how you would measure um, a practice qualitatively. And it's just a series of criteria in which you would see if you're doing them. And it's from a growth perspective and it builds off of one another. What that ultimately gives you is you can bring the practices behaviors because they impact outcomes. Right. So where we're landing with this is we have customer satisfaction. We know how to measure it. Right. From a retention rate, conversion rate, net promoter score. But we also should be looking at how well. Are we doing the practices and behaviors that will lead to customer satisfaction? Discovery is, I know who my customer is. I know their needs, right? I have customer journey maps. I have interactions with them. How well are we doing these things? Well, we should be measuring them because that'll be able to show our stakeholders we were moving in the right direction. And we can look at cause and effect of, if we do this really well, is it moving the needle? That's the idea here. So as we go forward, we have these four components of transformation that we can kind of all look at side by side and be able to tell a story, be able to say, hey, the reason that our retention rate and conversion rates are down is probably because we don't do demos the right way. We don't understand who our customers are, right? And so now we're, we're shifting left the cause of not moving the needle earlier in the process and identifying what needs to change to do this much better. So, so we're Mike, not yep. Yep, uh, we might not do the breakout room. We've got five minutes. Uh, if you're okay, we'll open up for Q&As and um, probably um, um, Yeah, that works, that works, that's yeah. fine. So we'll open up for Q&A. If anyone has any questions, uh, I know Ahmed, you had a question that we didn't get to you. So we'll give Ahmed the first dibs and um, please um, put your question in the chat. Come off camera, um, and yep, let's let's uh, ask our I, um, Mike for uh, guidance. Go for it, Amber. Yeah, can I can I voice? It? Yeah, can I voice it out instead of like oh. writing on on a text? Yeah, go for it, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it's what has been said by Mark today is really resonate and uh, hit the nail on the head. Indeed, yeah. So as I'm, I'm kind. of of really business transformation strategist and really facing sort of like resistance and what i have seen today is really something valuable and it's really could really bring uh, an outstanding business outcome to the leadership because as he often argued that they don't really care about the how and the uh, and the what what matters the most for them is the achieving the business outcome and help the company achieve its bottom line objectives so i just would like to another question like to, to comment or humbly asking if like there is sort of like further uh, you know session would be hosted would be great because we need to deep dive uh, into more details on, on, on today's session because it's really uh, beneficially and it's really help us move forward in, in any sort of like business transformation journey. Definitely yeah, um, and yep yeah, um, I, I might um, yeah definitely um, look at look at that and uh, try to convince Mike if he's not already convinced to come come join us in the community again. Yeah. Yeah. 
Eric. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the initial conversation we have with Mike is maybe to do once a month a, um, a session. Maybe we do it shorter, 45 minutes, where Mike can engage and answer some questions. Also, the next month, my uh, book is going to be available in Enterprise Agility. And, and then we can do some interesting things for everyone who are looking forward to take the industry in a different direction. But let's, let's ask Mike. I think he, he, he's open to, to run this experiment, too. Of course, yeah. of course. I feel like today um, we covered some foundational pieces, such as what is it that we should be looking at measuring, those four components, right? Tying them to outcomes and simplifying it. There's many, many things we can dive on in each one of those sections. Um, but the important thing today was how do we simplify and what are those prerequisites in simplifying? And I think we did a good job. Um, I hope, and I'm happy to get together on a monthly basis and talk through some concepts and maybe just do an open Q and A. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and also we do have Mike, um, um, he is being very generous today. He's giving us to, uh, take his, um, lean agile intelligence tool for a spin, uh, with the promo code. So. Um, the promo code is uh, Simplify6W. Um, please um, put on, uh, go on. And from personal experience, I've been experimenting it a lot with it. Um, so that'd be great. Before we log off in one minute, would love um, for everyone to just express what they feel, um, how they feel about it um, today. Um, um, from where they were at the start in one word, if you were to express what that would be. And also please do join us um, for future events. We do have Eric's book coming. We have Niroshi who's going to do a talk. We've got Mike who's, we've, uh, who's agreed to uh, come and do more talks for us. So that's really good. Um, yeah, feel free to put in, in the chat what you're feeling right now before we all go disperse. Um, and do join us in our community. So Mark is saying, uh, uh, Laila is saying lively, uh, Tanya is saying encouraged, Christian, uh, it's insightful. Silva, um, Sylvia is um, saying thanks. Uh, Leanne, curious to know more. Uh, Loretta, great ideas. Yeah, and, and anyone can find yeah. anyone can find me on LinkedIn and DM me with any questions. And also, the, I'm assuming there'll be a follow up email um, in which you can contact me directly. Yes, there will be one. Um, if everyone's okay to hang back, Mike, we Mike said he's okay to hang back for five minutes. Um, um, that's what. Uh, please feel free to um, ask your questions away. And um, great, go for it. You're on mute if you're talking great. Yeah, there we go. yeah my mic wouldn't come off. Um, Michael, so I think what we're finding is that um, such a valuable um, insights and there's going to be people in the community that are going to have questions. So as you mentioned, they can connect with you on LinkedIn. But would it be also okay if they start to ask questions in the community and then we can all share amongst each other as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's a better solution, Greg, right? um, to share all the learnings on the community and, and so everyone can abstract um, what we've learned. Um, Sylvie, you had put your hand up and I'm not sure if your question got answered. No, but, and I'll be quick. And um, this is something I've read somewhere and I'm kind of ambivalent into the, mm -hmm. let's call it the approach. I'd like to bounce it off you, Mike, and anybody who's still on the call. Um, when we were addressing and talking about resistance to change, uh, a, a, an article that I read, I can't remember where I read too many, was as opposed to kind of going on the proposal mode or suggestion mode or Oops. So the table. Sorry. Especially the executives. 
what happens if we don't do it? I find that's a bit playing with fire, so I'd like to get your take on it. What happens if we don't do it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's the million dollar question. Um, because, you know, things change so fast in today's markets and the proof is in the numbers, right? You can, you can look at the S&P, you can look at um, all the companies that have gone bankrupt over the years. Um, now is the time. And so they're, the, the longer they wait, the more risk they accrue. Um, now, I, I think it probably depends on the industry and how fast they have to act. But I truly believe that if you're not truly digital and collaborating and being able to respond to change in the next five to 10 years, you're going to be very far behind. And someone, you, you are really accruing the risk of being disrupted. Now, that's a tough conversation to have because the reality is a lot of these organizations may st be may making a lot of money right now, right? Um, so again, it takes that that open-minded leader, that proactive leader, um, the influential one that starts to look a little bit more in the future. Um, and again, it really it's that sense of urgency. It really needs to be there. Um, and asking the question, "What if we don't do it?" I think it has it has to create that urgency, right? So I probably, Sylvie, you're on mute if you're talking. Sorry. When I was reading the article, it was really in that frame of mind. A and also the, the situation that was brought to forward was, especially if you have a group of executives, so all the C-suite, let's call them this way, and you have two or three that are in line and then another two or three are disagree. So, and, you know, with all due respect, you get into what I call political battles and then nothing moves. Yep. So it was the, you know, the, the, kind of a bit of a bold, you know, shaking the, um, you know, the establishment type of context. But I'm reading, as I was reading this, I'm going, holy mother of God, I would hate to have that type of conversation. But I just wanted to have your take on it. But some of the points you brought were um, very valid, which if it was me would be, look at those who, quote unquote, failed before you. And maybe that'll get you to be motivated to align altogether. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sylvie. Um, anyone else um, have any burning questions um, that we can we we've taken Mike's five minutes um, uh, already? Anyone else has any burning questions that you will not uh, have a good uh, night's sleep, or you will be racking your brains the rest of the day if it does not get answered? Please. Um, yeah, if you're. Uh, one, one, one question. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, if you allow. Yeah, go me. for it. Yeah, go for Take it, Kamal. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, uh, my guess, you know, one of my the, uh, the often kind of challenges and, and pain points I hit during any sort of like business transformation. And by the way, I'm PMO, a project management office leader. So, it's, I often establish sort of like business driven uh, engines inside organizations. It's all about uh, achieving their business strategy fast and realizing the ROI. In, in the current company, I work for a business consulting firm. I had realized it's not like a big four one, but it's uh, like mid-sized kind of company. So I, I come to know that there is, no, there is no even strategy. So I'm sensing there is a gap in sort of like a strategic alignment and often the middle uh, team or the middle managers, the project managers so often is not really engaged or haven't been really part of our business transformation journey. And I believe this is one of the cause or the legitimate rationale why we hit resistance often. So I'm often pushing the CEO, I'm reporting to him, I'm telling him we need to bring every single one into the fold, bring them to our inner circle to, to ensure this kind of business transformation, a successful journey. So how could possibly uh, convince him? Because I, I'm not trying to sell anything, I'm trying just to show him a positive value. And I'm afraid like in, in a short time, if he doesn't really touch an, a business outcome, or value out of TPMO, he might assume it's like concentric. So cost is not like uh, me moving the needle forward. So what, so, yeah. what strategy should I approach him or what sort of like a business is speak? I will articulate to him to help him to understand lacking or having no strategy at the first place. This is number one challenge. Number two, there is no sort of like alignment Sorry. and there is 
Yeah, sorry, Ahmed. Uh, if you can post your question, we'll definitely loop back with Michael because we've, he's been very generous. We've taken a lot of his time. Um, if you can post the question on the community or send it to, on the chat, we will definitely make sure Michael um, gets a chance to answer your question. Sure, uh, sure. thank you so much. Not a problem. your time. No problem. Thank you very much. And again, everyone, you've been really amazing. Thank you for being so gracious of your time. And please, uh, let's um, give Michael a great um, applause um, for uh, just inspiring us and taking us through the journey of transformation. So, Michael, thank you very much. Thanks for being with the community. And um, we all will be touched shortly. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. This has been Simplifying Transformation Through Measurement and Visualization with Michael McCalla and the great team from the Enterprise Agility World Community. If you have questions, join us at community.eau.university. We are here to grow your career.